My name is Michael Belcher. I am a cinematographer. And one of the things about cinema that becomes immediately apparent anytime you try to make some cinema is how incredibly difficult it is. Sometimes it feels like an impossible task, actually. There are simply too many elements to try to control, from the weather to just all the humans who are involved in making something. Films are not usually made in a vacuum with robots, and so failure, to some extent, or just a lack of control, is a big part of the experience of filmmaking. And at the same time, it's a resource. There's something that can happen in the imperfections, in that lack of complete control that can end up being really meaningful and really valuable and can actually be the things that bring a scene or a moment in a film to life. And some filmmakers work with this quality as part of their process using improvisation or happenstance or just a spirit of finding or discovering something while they're making a movie. And so failure is something that we explore in this conversation, which is between me and cinematographer Sean Price Williams discussing Swamp Thing, the 1982 film by Wes Craven. A little bit about Sean. He is a very prolific, very unique cinematographer known for such films as Good Time, The Color Wheel, Queen of Earth, Heaven Knows What, and Her Smell. Early in his career, Sean worked with Albert Maisels as a cameraman and archivist, and now Sean is one of the most prominent cinematographers in independent cinema. He collaborates with a wide variety of filmmakers and artists across documentary, fiction, and fine art installation. Sean was a longtime employee of famed New York video store Kim's Video and Music, and if the word cinephile can be used to describe anyone, I think it can be used to describe Sean. He has seen a lot of movies. And as such, it was lovely to speak with him. So here we go. Enjoy. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I guess people might pick a movie that they love that they wish they had done. But then, you know, I, I think that's kind of crazy because, um, I don't know, I mean, if, if I had done it, then it wouldn't be a movie I'd love, I guess. So it, it had I had to think of just I mean really it's, there's the movie that I really wish that I could make but I know I won't ever be able to make and that's sort of that is Swamp Thing but there is a movie that exists that is Swamp Thing and there's a sequel and then there's a cartoon CV series and then there's a two or three series and they're all pretty pretty much they miss the uh, they miss the uh, the opportunity I guess with that character and so it's been frustrating always to me since I was about, well, I first started reading it when I was six, the comic book. And, uh, and it kind of um, more than any book or anything probably uh, sort of shaped, shaped something in my head of, of uh, I don't know, like a, a character that I related to. And so the movie, uh, which I saw, you know, pretty soon after I discovered the character in the comics, uh, I thought was terrible, even at that age, like eight or so. I really hated that movie. And uh, I don't know if it was because the costume looked so stupid, um, because I do, uh, yeah. But uh, the way, reason I picked Swamp Thing is because it also just touches on bigger missed opportunities in, in cinema at large or whatever, you know? It's just kind of like this, uh, the wrong headedness, which has gotten, which is just continues. Uh, and gets even more and more wrong. So um, that that was why I picked it. Not to really talk about the Wes Craven swamp thing that much, but but to talk about missed opportunities in general, maybe. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, man. I, I'd love to hear what the, um, you know, what the diamond is inside a swamp thing that you connected to, you know, in the first place. So it's not even about the movie. It was just swamp thing as a character or as a, you know, as yeah. a, a story. Yeah. I was... I was like, uh, yeah, where I grew up was pretty rural and, and I didn't have any brothers or sisters and, you know, I didn't really, I was pretty much alone all the time. And so I would, uh, I don't know, I just was alone. I, you know, I didn't see friends very often or, or um, anything like that because uh, everyone was so far away. I couldn't, I didn't have a neighborhood or anything that, or anyone I could bike to or anything like that. So there's a kind of loneliness, I guess, that I had. I've, I've read things that I wrote as a little kid, too, that are, like, really sad. <laughs> you know, it's kind of sad, romantic uh, things or whatever. And, you know, I watched E.T. and the, this, the, the, the obvious movies that anyone my age was watching and loving. Um, 
but they were all just it was you know i didn't ha i didn't really watch them with people usually or anything like that so i think there's a loneliness to swamp thing and kind of a, and then it's it sort of i think i don't know if it you know what a chicken or an egg or whatever but like i sort of feel like um as i was getting older and and uh, i just started to kind of keep going back to swamp thing um in my teen years and everything i think as like a character that i um kept finding myself relating to more and more like he's a guy who you know is not understood correctly ever uh he's doing good but he's a big monster that can't talk you know or he, he sort of some it depends on who was writing the series can talk talks in thought bubbles um uh you know there's like this kind of communication issues let's say we can sort of, and uh and then being misunderstood and you know, just being this kind of big lonely galoot uh wandering around who's in love with this girl always there's like someone he's in love with but you know he's not human so that's tricky you know love story i don't know all this stuff is sort of related to as a teenager and then again, as a young, like I started to read it again in my 20s, just go back to this, particularly the Alan Moore ones. Um, the Alan Moore wrote in 83, I guess, to 87 or something like this, 88. The first few story arcs were the ones that I read as a kid, like, and I read them over and over and over. So yeah, the, the, very, the very original appearance of Swamp Thing is still like the most uh, beautiful sort of short comic book uh, love story thing to me, I think. And I just don't know and why that's before before Alan Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first, first one, yeah, appearance okay. in like seventy two or something like this. I don't know. Uh, I don't understand why. As always, like with like the Punisher movies and other comic book, because I, I really loved comic books so much as a kid, I, and I hate all the movies. Um, <clears throat> they have these great, you know, storyboarded, uh, perfectly illustrated. Uh, the timing, everything is there. Like why don't they just adapt directly i think everybody must wonder this but like yeah why do they make these changes to, to make it i don't know just it's i mean but then it, maybe it's pointless to make the movie at all if it's just going to be you know uh, uh um you know moving moving image of what exists already but unfortunately it doesn't seem like the brains in hollywood machines don't ever know how to make it better so they should just go back to the original yeah i want to i want to talk about um, the way these things get adapted. But before we do that, I want to talk it's, some more it's about... It's relevant again because I just went to a movie this weekend, you know, we we're all so excited to go back to the movies. And it was like, you know, an adaptation of some young adult book or whatever. And it was just so horrible, so terrible. Mm. Like everything about it, any any idiot could be watching it and know how to make it work. And it d doesn't work at all. Anyway. Yeah. I often feel like no movie should be made once. It should all be made twice. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I almost always just like, oh, just give them like, give them one more try at that. You know, yeah, let them they, try to make only, this film one more time. They only remake the ones that were perfect the first time around. So right. <laughs> never bother to, yeah. Oh, that's a great irony there. Yeah. Um. So before we go too far away from this this character, I I want to dig into a little bit because. I uh, you know I. I didn't grow up, I grew up with a sibling in rural Pennsylvania. And, you know, I think this sort of alienation that we're alluding to for the swamp thing being sort of perpetually alone or rejected and misunderstood and sort of well-intentioned, but um, can't quite seem to be seen, you know, mm -hmm. can't quite get someone to, to see him clearly um, until perhaps his love interest. Um, it's just such a relatable experience, especially as a creative person. You know, I, I grew up in a very non-creative community and it sounds yeah. like maybe you did too. Me and too. Yeah, yeah. there's something about that journey that, that feels like it's captured in, in Swamp Thing. And, you know, thinking about Wes Craven's version of it, there's a piece of dialogue that feels like it, it gets at this idea, but it's not really like this, this, the movie hasn't earned it. It hasn't built the world and had the story play out because he says he has this line when he sort of, finally has a quiet moment um, with his love interest where he says, um, every day is a dream when you're alone. And I was like, it's been like one day, <laughs> you know, in the story, it's like, it's been, a, it's been like maybe, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, maybe that was the only thing that was left from like a really early draft of the script that was actually really great. <laughs> yeah. But they had to add a bunch of machine guns and like all this other nonsense and they uh, took it off track. So what do you feel like um, 
why do you feel like it, it won't be made like made the right way it feels like it certainly could be yeah because i think they keep they keep focusing on uh, i don't know what this the new series i only watched part of an, an episode um i had the intentions of just watching it anyway but i just it's really hard to watch a series for me i can't I just can't engage with those things very well. They, they, they put me off pretty quick, usually. Yeah, talk to me about your experience, like the way you approach going to the movies and how you think about it, because it feels like you have an amazing, like, openness. It's mostly old movies, though, uh, really. That's so I'm kind of cheating. So what is the difference for you seeing an older film that is imperfect or bad, maybe, and then seeing a newer film, do you feel like it's just less of an excuse for them to still be not hitting the mark? Like I was saying to my girlfriend, this movie we watched uh, a few nights ago here at home from the 80s, uh, you know, just the, you know, the scale of it's so much smaller. So, you know, yeah, it's who knows, maybe it was like a $2 million movie or something or less than uh you know you 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 forgive you forgive the the crumminess a bit you know or you get really excited when there's something that's not crummy because maybe it all should just be crummy and so it actually kind of you know it's like oh wow they got how did you know how did that happen at this sort of you know uh crummy level of filmmaking how did this kind of beautiful little moment happen or something or this decision that was made uh happen and then you know so that's you know that that's it and yeah also yes i've got some movies I've been watching lately that I used to not really like that I like now because I just know um, the, you know, the director is operating the camera and, and figuring out what he wants to be looking at while, while it's rolling and while the actors are doing what they were told to do. And, and you're missing, you know, you're missing everything basically while you're, while he's trying to focus and find things. I mean, that's like the most extreme example of sort of like something I'm very charmed by now. Uh, in, in bad movies, in a bad movie, um, when you really just feel like they're trying to figure out while the film is rolling, you know, <laughs> that's the most fun thing for me. Now they had no time, or or just didn't think that it was. Uh, they didn't believe that they would have had a good idea before the camera was rolling. So <laughs> this is a terrible thing if I'm to be taken seriously professionally at all to talk about enjoying. But I do. I feel like that is fun. That is part of the fun sometimes. You know, uh, we'll figure it out when we're when we're there. I mean, and usually more interesting ideas happen that way. And so you find in these movies where they were obviously having to make a decision like that. OK, we'll figure it out when we get there. And you find they did figure something out while they got there. And that's like I don't know, refreshing to me and instead of figuring everything out and planning everything to death. And then you execute exactly what you, you know, seven screenwriters, uh, uh, came up with and then it's like wow that's uh that's that's an idea that a six-year-old would have had and that's all you got you know 100 million dollar movie that's all you've got you know you, you feel like a lot of movies that are getting made now at least ones that are larger and get advertising and get in all the theaters um are a little too planned and have just a little bit of a dead feeling instead of that aliveness that finding it that the energy and spark you know, they go through so much of a process that the first things that, I mean, even like when I, I work on movies and I see the first cut and I see subsequent cuts and stuff and, and I find often it's like, you know, I'm, every, I've said this to everybody, like the first things that, that you start to cut out are the things that actually gave it the character, you know, that gave it a, any sort of like a flavor, you know, it's like, okay, you know, trim off the crust and, and then like, yeah, but that was where all the burnt parts were, you know, that's, it's for the best part sometimes it's the first thing to go so it, it happens i think with you know with the large stuff in every step of it so yeah you've you mentioned in another interview that um you know in this quote you talk about just being more focused on the film than your actual specific cinematography work and it's relatable you know to to be a cinematographer and to try to just make the best movie possible regardless of of your own craft and I just think that's a that's it's it's a familiar feeling. It's hard to um, it's hard to do our work and focus so much on making great images when a lot of times we care more about performance, right? So we'll just we won't polish something if we can get a few more takes in, and we won't um, 
you know, we won't, we'll sacrifice things. I, I wish actually maybe my problem was more like what you just said, you know, where I'm actually like, you know, engaged more in the performance, like when we're shooting, cause I'm operating myself and there's just like so many things. And, you know, I tend to be doing a focus again lately after uh, a few years of having the more traditional focus part doing that. Uh, and I've actually found that I'm much more engaged with the material now again, like I used to be in a good, in a healthy way when I'm doing focus, somehow having more chores, I feel like I'm more with, with the, with the truth of what's happening, I guess. Yeah. And, um, and then when you see the movie put together later and you see the truth isn't there anymore, you know, because they've, uh, they've, they've gotten clever or, or they thought that they, you know, they thought something after the fact and they've kind of done things to make that thought uh, happen for them. And then they missed the truth of what we were getting in the, in the production, you know, in, in principal photography or whatever. And that could be really heartbreaking. That's all, you know, cleverness and, in, in, you know, later on down the line and then you lose the, you lose the, the plot a bit of what, what we were actually getting there. I, I still sort of have this, old fashioned feeling that, 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 that is like the movie that we're making on set is the movie that needs to be made and not something that you've like, you know, changed and repositioned and repurposed and, and uh, monkeyed around with in the, in the, in the edit. You, I think you lose the, I think you lose the heart of it there sometimes. Um, I want to ask you about operating. I, I think your camera operating is um, incredible to be honest. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know anybody else in our generation who is, who is, who is doing more, um, just like very visceral and um, just connected to the truth of the moment. Um, and so it really comes through. I, I, I really uh, applaud you for your ability to do that. How do you think about it? How do you develop that? I know you've obviously have some, some doc experience in your past coming up that way. And how, how do you feel about it now and how has it changed? Yeah, a lot of it is doc and a lot of it is is um, probably also just trying to get close to people. Um, you know, like if I'm choosing lenses, the first question I usually have is what's the close focus, you know, like how, you know, before I have to use dop diopters and things like that. Um, uh, Cause yeah, it really is actually uh, probably one of the first things I, I you know, and, and it, it is just getting closer and closer to people without, you know, making them, taking them apart, you know, I mean, uh, I think early on, I was really always just zoomed in all the way to the face, you know, and, and everything I was doing was kind of like that. And then also, then we started doing our low budget movies. I've said all this probably before, but you know, uh, you know, when you're just close up on people, then there has, then there's no art department, you could be shooting anywhere and like, you know, things, it's just cheat, it's cheat, it's cheating. Um, by necessity it's not cheating it's survival <laughs> yeah 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 but i sort of and then i and then i, I had the uh, you know brilliant stage where i said oh actually i'm gonna be shooting wider now but then i would just get closer and closer to the people now on these wide lenses so <clears throat> i was less shy but yeah then and then working with albert mazels for a few years was really fun and and and, and being i was his archivist and i was going through all of his material all the old outtakes from salesman and gimme shelter and all this sort of stuff and that was really that was really uh incredible just looking at all that stuff and you know looking at just beautiful images that are that were you know not intended for anybody to see ever and and it kind of i don't know it, it made, made, made me uh well i don't know it, i don't know what that really did for my camera operating but as a as a as a as some, I mean, you know, those movies are miracles how, how, how they come together at all, his movies in particular, because there, there's very much, it's very much impulsive filmmaking. And, and I think that, that kind of goes into what I was talking about earlier, where just figuring it out and, I, and uh, why, when you're there. And I, and I still just love this, this kind of um, approach to fiction, even when you have a script and actors. And I know maybe actors sometimes, I, I, I really respect actors and I really admire them. And, and I, and I, uh, and I know I probably try their patience sometimes because, because they, they're prepared and they know the lines, but maybe we don't exactly know how we want to do it. And maybe because sometimes it's the director doesn't, didn't have the visual, uh, you know, plan 
or maybe it's because we intentionally just didn't want to and we wanted to figure it out there and it's raining maybe or it's not and so things change and um but as far as operating this is the most long-winded detour uh yeah i don't know it's it's really just like kind of a there's a hanging out and then when things get intense then 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 we all get intense together and i don't know i just i'm, I'm like an actor or, or try to be i guess because uh, I wish maybe I was, you know, more uh, a charming person that could be on camera, but instead I'm just this swamp thing behind it. <laughs> well, in the film... Uh-oh, I, I can't hear you. Uh, thanks for your patience, man. Yeah, my computer just got bogged down somehow. So I changed costumes. So now you're going to have continuity issues if you try to use any of that old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, well, we were talking about operating and more specifically yeah, yeah. on her smell, which is like a masterclass in operating. It's just amazing. And it's so sneaky. I didn't even realize until like halfway through the the kind of extended opening sequence backstage after the show, just how intricate those scenes are. Yeah. So, uh, of course, that's an example, like none of the other ones I've worked on where we, we it was the, the whole it was, you know, Alex's we make we 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 embrace unconventional like um i don't know approaches to making movies and 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 i i think some of the movies we've made together are really horrible like so bad you know and then there's other ones that you know where it works but this is all part of it and that one we had designed basically the idea was we would we would rehearse a, a whole sequence uh it's five parts right i think it's like five chunks or whatever um, we would break the chunks down into like halves. So we would basically spend a whole day or maybe even two days just rehearsing with camera and everything and then roll on the third day. That was like, that was the idea originally. Um, and that is basically what we did. I mean, we would do, I think we kind of would end up rolling some film every day, but a lot of, most of the day was really just, just the rehearsals and, and uh, choreographing, especially in the behind backstage stuff and all. And that was kind of like where we were trying to get a little like, uh, well, I was thinking about Fellini and things like that, just kind of these kind of these moves past characters, characters just sort of like um, popping into the frame and out and then, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. It was like, we was, it was very choreographed. Yeah, so that's it, that's it. And that was really fun for the actors, I think, to just play, you know, and it wasn't tedious. It never felt tedious. Sometimes it would be really, uh, we would do one sort of general kind of like, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, it was probably, there was a lot of problem solving and, and it was awkward at times because it sort of seemed like this is, is this worth this effort? I mean, what like could this possibly mean? You know, like, why are we, what is this? Is, is it be, the material sort of sometimes became like, okay, is this stupid? Like this whole thing that we're doing, is this totally just stupid now? <laughs> like we're, we're, we're belaboring this, uh, these, these details and it's like, but is it, you know, so, yeah, we'd get into this. Alex and I would get into got it. We actually it was mostly mostly very fun that that shoot, but we got into a couple little tiffs occasionally. Just it was just that I was like, wait a second. Now I'm like, you know, wait, this is a happy ending. This like what 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 you know? I just really started to like gripe with some of that sort of stuff. But it was really because of this kind of rehearsal, 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 and then it's like, oh god, now we got to film that. Oh shit, that's not what I, that's not what the, that, that, that's not where this movie should go. So that was, yeah, I'm giving, I shouldn't say these things, but, um, but through these rehearsal well, processes. You're speaking, you're speaking the internal monologue of, I think, any DP ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tricky because, you know, we have, we have the hierarchy of decision making, you know, going through the director always. Yeah. And, and so much of our job is like permission based, you know, in a pretty uncomfortable way, certainly for me. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, and then you know the scenes, the scenes with the kind of the most chaos. We were also off in Steadicam, uh, which you know I have one operator I, I work with that I just really love. He's he's great, and and uh, and he's also very like, um, he's just very he's very engaged. Also, you know, and and sometimes I actually don't know what I'm even doing there, you know, like because he's really like, you know, uh, he's really taking charge, which I love, you know. And then I get to just watch it on the monitor. I used to have a problem with that. I used to think, get really bored and, and really feel frustrated not not operating. So I would hate when sometimes it'd be like, okay, it's steady cam day today. Oh boy. 
Um, but now I, but then I, I've, I really loved it with her smell and, uh, and with good time also, he's the same, same steady cam guy. So just to make sure you have it right. So the, the way you guys would approach that was for each chunk of material you're shooting, you take a day or two to rehearse that. And so you would be there with the camera lensing it all there, watching a monitor. So I know what it's going to be and working it out and then shooting it potentially yeah. the next day. Or yeah. Day after. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, for budget reasons, also shooting on 35 millimeter and all, it was like, you know, couldn't just be rolling all the time. Though I do really, again, I do feel like we did film something every day, at least almost like just a little bit, something here and there. But the, then the third, the third uh, act or whatever of it, which is in the middle of this red room, that was all handheld. And, and I was, you know, I, I uh, split Kara, Kara's lip uh, once I got too close. I was hitting people with the camera in there. We were really like, we were really fighting with each other. And uh, that mm. was, that was kind of, that was pretty fun. Um, but otherwise, my family, um, yeah, I don't know. We we had a different approach to each sequence. Then there was the in the recording studio. We we're all like, it's all just on tri on you know dolly. We're just kind of rocking back and forth. You know, that's my favorite actually. That's the most kind of uh, I don't know. To me, that there's there's we were doing much more with lights and everything. Even though it's kind of the most seems like the most normal part of the movie. Mm. To me, it's the it's the most it was it's one of the things I'm most proud of that I've done that that middle sequence, that sequence in the recording studio, the second part. Um, yeah, I would do a commentary track to that, that sequence, you know, on, on a Blu-ray, I would love to, because it really is a lot we were doing. Yeah, unpack it for me because yeah, it does seem like visually it's more mellow. It's a little bit more observational. You kind of get in there when the younger girls come in, you're, you kind of get close from there, but a lot of it's sort of a little bit more step back. Yeah, well, I th we kind of let them bring we let them we let them bring a kind of an energy in there that kind of a little disruptive energy. So we tried to do that. Yeah, it just was it's just was we were it was well mannered, well behaved, I guess. Sorry, and uh, but 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 we had to be like Moss. She had to be uh, sort of driving uh, driving the camera moves. And they had to be more, but but they weren't crazy, you know. She's like, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know how. Now that I said I would do a commentary, well, it, it really would have to be watching it. And I can tell you, there was these things we were doing with reflections also in the glass. My friend Keith is working the the knobs in the control room, and I and I, I had this. Me and Danny, uh, Danny and I, the gaffer and I, we we had this kind of thing like we wanted Keith to be in every shot at least reflected you know i mean he's not but he really is almost so we would be having him just somehow in almost every shot in that scene and it reflected somewhere and so we would be setting up lights even just for that to happen and um and that you know it's pretty tight in the in the control room and we would bring this dolly in this incredible uh dolly grip who i had, had uh, just met right around that time um he's just uh yeah it was just i would just not give him any really any direction i just he would just be watching um uh, he doesn't really look at monitors either which i like dolly grips that don't use monitors they, that are just kind of watching the action and responding to it like that i think that's uh classy um yeah, I don't know. We were kind of just, we were just, it was, I was just really in heaven. Like we, and then there'd be music, she'd be doing music performance and we would just always kind of be in the right spot at the right time. And, and uh, it was, she was driving us, I think, you know, her, her performance and trying to get my friend Keith in every shot. That was like, you know, those were our little guiding lights and it worked out, I think. One thing, one thing that you're speaking to that, that feels like pretty, a pretty uh, impressive accomplishment that I think a number of your films have is the way you switch between handheld, steady cam, dolly, um, tripod, and it just it never feels different. It always feels just or just with the characters. It always know, feels shaky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shaky yeah. focus. But there's, I don't think so. I think there's a way in which her smell and good time were the ones that come to mind for me. Yeah, I feel like they really have a imperceivable shift between these different camera modes and i'm wondering how you make those decisions because it's kind of an outstanding quality that it always just feels i'm just i'm just in it you know i, I don't really yeah. notice it until i'm thinking about it as a filmmaker usually after the fact yeah how, how do you think about what to do when uh well well steady cam we have to reserve for because it you know it costs extra and it's an, it's extra time it's extra it's an extra person and uh it's the guy who's breaking his back, so he he charges a little more. 
and yeah, once you're on Steadicam, the big, the my, one of my big issues with Steadicam in general is uh, is the laziness that happens when you know okay, the camera's on Steadicam, so now you start doing these shots while it's on Steadicam that are really wrong. Like for Ste- it's like it's and I see it in movies and all the time. You know, it's like get that thing off of there. It's not just, you know okay. Like you've really got to be. It's got to be called for. Um, otherwise, it's yeah, it's really it's you know pick like picking up like you know b-roll and stuff on steady cam it's just crap like that these awkward angles it's all wrong it's wrong lens it's like oh god uh so yeah i just try to avoid that okay that's the first that's the first rules around steady cam so also i still prefer to be on dolly or handheld like usually anyway or or on, on a tripod um i did this movie last year and uh the director really was not just didn't just didn't i don't know he just he liked us to be very mobile so we didn't we were we were on tripod maybe twice in the whole shoot and both those shots are like the ones on tripod are entirely in in the movie you know it's like and he's like he's like oh, this is the best shot of the movie like, yeah because we like i got to actually like make a shot <laughs> instead of i'm just chasing action around stuff like that um so yeah you just got there's got to be a little bit of patience for that and uh, uh but uh, I mean, steady can I mean, handheld is 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 a pleasure. It's my, you know, I, if it's the right kind of camera for the right thing, I, I'm happy to be holding it all the time, sitting in a chair on the floor, running around with it. I don't know. It's uh, yeah. It, it's it's uh, you know. It's I usually ask the director. I said, "Is this handheld or or, or you know?" I don't. So it's not even my call half the time, really. I don't impose those things too much. I can suggest. Yeah. Well, I guess the feedback I'll give you is that um, the thing, the whatever mode seems to be chosen for a lot of the films, especially when you're mixing it up a lot, I, I never notice it. It always feels really natural, and um, and I never see the seams. You know, it's 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 an accomplishment, man. It's awesome. Yeah. In good time, we did a shot. Uh, <clears throat> it was the, it was the day that that Anne from Kodak was there, wa- observed watching us. You know. And it was a dolly shot. It was a really fast dolly move. And, um, you know, it was, it probably should have been steady cam maybe, but we didn't have steady that day. So whatever, we laid down track and we did this, you know, fast dolly move. It was really, you know, and I, we did it like 15 times. It was so embarrassing. You know, it's embarrassing when you have people visiting and they see you just making 14 mistakes. And then, uh, yeah, that, so that happens. <laughs> Wait, I had another uh, an anecdote, but I forgot a similar, more, it was a better one too. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, right. I know. Okay. So then uh, this Tesla movie I did, we had a jib, sort of this kind of crazy jib thing for uh, for one shot. And, and while we had it, I was like, well, wait, maybe we could do this. And my camera assistant who works constantly, Bailey, um, he just gets very amused when when he sees me with a new toy or a new tool and i'm using it like kind of all wrong he says he said he's said it to me you know because i do something just he just loves watching me operate incorrectly with these tools and stuff and because then we get some totally wacky thing that kind of might work or it gets cut out but um i do have fun misusing things like that <laughs> a crane or a toy a, a dolly do you, do you still feel like you haven't made a real movie? That's that you've, I hear, I've read that in at least two interviews with you and it, it's shocking to me. I guess there's a couple of movies in the video hound and uh, there was one movie in the Leonard Malton video guide that that's, that made me feel somewhat legitimate. <laughs> if they're in those books, then, then I guess, then I guess they count as a real movie. Well, I mean, there's a way in which everything that we're involved in we know we you know we know how it was made, so it doesn't have the same sort of illusion of magic as you know movie watching is for most of us. So it's hard to have the same feeling watching it. Um, but I just wonder, what else makes you say that, or what is a real movie if not the ones that you make? You know, I watch again. I watch these things on VHS that are are, are um, the most inconsequential movies, and still they feel like more real to me because. Uh, yeah, there's like, uh, you know, a lot of people that worked on it and there's a, there's a video label on it and there's, um, you know, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very old, old brain I have with that sort of thing. So seeing a movie at a, at a, at a film festival 
and then it never gets distributed beyond that. It doesn't feel like a real movie. It feels like, you know, yeah. It feels like we're pl- we're playing playing. We're just still playing around. Well, speaking to that, I just saw um, the trailer for um, Jessica Oreck's film, uh, One Man Dies a Million Times. And it looked amazing, man. And I couldn't figure out how to watch it. Is it not available anywhere? Yeah, no, because, uh, well, they were going to, it was going to get a little run at Metrograph last May, but that all didn't happen. Um, so I don't know where it's, where it's like kind of stuck, you know? Yeah, that one kind of looks like a real movie. We made that That's beautiful in, in, in uh, we did two trips there. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And we shot that on, but we shot it on a Sony FS seven, which is like a pro prosumer camera, you know, but I love the camera and I was like, yeah, let's shoot it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll shoot it in black and white on the FS seven. And, and uh, I think it looks really awesome. And we had these really old Russian lenses and I was doing my focus and, and, uh, I was just, I was, I don't know, I was, I was very, str- I was struck looking at this like the whole time. That actually looked like a movie while we we were we were making it. I'm um, getting back to Swamp Thing to some extent. I mean, maybe this question doesn't apply to Swamp Thing exactly, but I pick it. I pick it in my just miserablest uh, sort of attitude and approach to everything. I, that's why I picked it. You know, it's the, it's that's that's all. It, that's why I picked that stupid movie to talk about because <laughs> we can't even talk about it because it's not worth talking about. <laughs> I think it is worth talking about in, in a lot of ways. Um, one thing that comes to mind is is just thinking about how comic books get made into live action fairly commonly now. But I wonder why there's not more animated films. And I'm just curious if you yeah. enjoy animated films or if you ever think about being involved in the production of one um, with your skill set. That's a wild idea. I've, I've definitely never considered it. And uh uh, and I don't really watch, I, I don't like those Miyazaki movies. I actually don't like uh, cartoons that, um, even like Tom and Jerry and stuff, I don't like that stuff that, that don't respect like physics and stuff. I think, I think the, the, the job of animation is to be as crazy and, you know, to go, you know, Fantasia and all this sort of stuff. But at the same time, I get like really uh, bored with it immediately when there's no like, um, borders also I, I i like experimental animation you know 10 minute movies or something like that um but uh yeah i can't watch it, animated features almost ever it's really hard hmm. and i grew up with like you know there's some good ones and stuff i watch muppets i'll watch like a jim henson thing because there's some you know some reality i don't know somehow because it's there's gravity and there's physics um but but for some reason I can't, I can't stand when people are flying around and jumping and doing like things that I dream about. But I don't like to watch animated movies. And I did. There's one of the comics that I really always wanted to also make into a movie when I was a teenager was uh, Cerebus, Cerebus the Aardvark. And I thought that would be a really cool, um, like kind of like a it's black and white, like a black and white Roger Rabbit. You know, like the style of Roger Rabbit with real people and cartoons, but black and white. I don't know. I thought that would be. Uh, really beautiful there's one story arc in it um that that would also be just like a perfect movie uh but that's a he's a bit of a maniac the the writer and it was the the creator of it uh he's kind of a, he used to be a hero of mine but yeah so so there the, i have thought about that oh yeah actually i have a there's a serial killer movie i want to make that 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 would have to be animated just because i think we couldn't do it otherwise it's too gruesome it's too gruesome. Yeah, I like the idea of a really sick cartoon uh, movie, cartoon movie, <laughs> animated film, animated feature. Well, there's something interesting about what you're saying because um, it sounds like you're wanting the animated films to be more grounded in reality and grounded in physics to to be able to land on you. And there's a way in which I feel like a lot of your films that, that you've made have a, a real hi- either hyper real or just hyper it's just, it's almost like the work you do is actually kind of smearing, it's kind of a more ungrounded sense of reality because it's so expressive, you know, it's so um, um, impressionistic a lot of times. And it's interesting how they're, they're, it's similar in a way, you're kind of taking the, the grounding out of a lot of the live action work that you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I get into textures and stuff for sure. And, and uh junking the image up you know grainy 
and uh, I do kind of, I mean, I think I'm very interested in, in trying to make the, the actual uh, image uh, quality, uh, not quality, text, just texture. And so I, 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 try to, I try to sort of destroy it a little bit. I mean, even when we were shooting mini DV, um, just trying to break that, you know, because it, it was usually not a choice to shoot on mini DV, you know, things like it was just, you know, you guys said, okay, let's, what can we do to make it not look like this? And so I've kind of still do that, you know, and, and when we're shooting on an Alexa or some camera that everybody's using, we've got to figure out how to just basically, you know, yeah, smash it up a bit, you know, and now I'm like using digital Bolex for everything I shoot. And, and now I'm like shooting yesterday, I was shooting with uh, like lenses that I would have been using in, in, you know, in film school on, on a real Bolex you know, little, little various white tarlins and things like that, you know, cause now I'm like, well, yeah, let's, let's go back to that and make a mess of this, you know, but now we know how to use other tools. Let's go back and use those things and, and kind of mess it up. Yeah. Let's make it grainy and, and push it, I guess. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. No, I'm kind of interested in, in, in uh, watching some animation today. I have a whole list for you because watching Swamp Thing made me think about it. Yeah. Send me a list. Yeah, I'll, I'll email you a few that I think you'll you'll dig. Um, the kind of last question I have is it's kind of a multi question, but I, I I I want to talk to you a little bit about the future of cinema, both in the terms of where you want to see things go, but also just thinking about what you think the role of cinema ought to be. You know, like what do you what do you think movies should be striving to do in general, or in the case of one that you might like. I, I, what's the what's the job of the, of the films? I don't know. I mean, Jesus, like what? To, I mean, to to like hopefully just to like kind of. Uh, I mean, now I mean, there's specific jobs maybe that movies could bring people together uh, a little bit, right? Make people laugh at each other at themselves. That's something that I really would like to see. Um, people just sort of like enjoying watching themselves look stupid, because I don't understand how people take themselves so seriously these days with these, you know insane positions on things that that people like seem to be represented re represented by things that definitely didn't matter to them before now they're now everyone's like politicized and stuff like that i want people to just like laugh at themselves again uh, so that's something that movies can do you know when you get into a room with a bunch of people and, and you're all just laughing at yourselves or and at each other at the same time that's something that a movie can do now i would really think would be useful and yeah, to be to to make us dreamers again and hope for something, you know, a little more. I think movies can do that. Uh, educate, sure, you know, whatever. Not 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 particularly well. <laughs> movies don't do that very well. Or, you know, we don't really learn history that well from watching them. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the laughing thing is really something that I feel like is is missing. But now it's like because of you know just fear of of fear of comedy that you know so that fear of being getting into troubles you know making fun of somebody all that kind of stuff yeah yeah which is which is really unfortunate because it makes us all just uh actually i think angry when we can't laugh so <laughs> if laughter is the best medicine then what the hell are we doing right now like you know i mean and then unfortunately there's you know a lot of people that there's only one person for the last four years that made them laugh you know we've got i've got friends that that i know feel felt that way <laughs> so you get into screwed up place um, so movies, uh, I think movies are, it's their responsibility a little bit to kind of take us away from that. That shouldn't be a reality. I don't know. That's a big question. Crazy question you ask. It <laughs> it's is. like saying, what's your favorite music? What's your favorite band? <laughs> um, yeah, I just like to put it out there and see what, um, what bubbles up because you can take it so many ways. I give you a couple of things and that's the sort of thing I'll be thinking of the rest of the day. And of course, wish I'd said this or that.